Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Financing Social Entrepreneurship via Microfinance session. Moderated by Samuel Klaus, Senior Investment Officer, European Investment Fund, with the participation of Peter Surek, Head of Social Banking, Erste Group, CEO, Erste Social Finance Holding, Hamed Odibechecht, Founder and CEO, Pontur, Bogdan Merfea, Social Banking Promoter, Board Member, Patria Bank, Executive Director at Roma Entrepreneurship Development Initiative Fund. Neoclis Tamkos, CEO, Microsmart. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you for the introduction um, and thank you for being here. It's after lunch. I know that's the toughest time of the day, but I, I hope that uh, you will, uh, you will uh, appreciate the, the session this afternoon. So I am um, very pleased today um, that we can, we, we, I've got a very reputable panel today and uh, uh, Andrea accepted to, to join at the last minute since uh, Bogdan, I think, had uh, an issue with the plane to come, if I understand Neoclis. Huh? So we all know each other for a long time. I would want that um, it's a, an informal session where we would brainstorm, we would try to bring experiences, things, uh, think about the future. And the very first thing I need to, to do, maybe it's to uh, present, uh, or maybe it's not needed, but just uh, so, uh, <laughs> maybe starting um, uh, with, with you, um, Hamed, so you are uh, coming from Sweden. Um, you are the founder of and CEO of Puncher. You will explain to us what it is to be at this position uh, with Puncher. Uh, then, um, Peter, you are well known also in the industry, so uh, head of the social banking uh, for Esther uh, Bank, if I'm not mistaken. Is still uh, the case, obviously, yes. And uh, Neoclis, who are also hosting us, um, so you uh, are the CEO and founder of Microsmart. So thanks a lot, uh, gentlemen, to be, to be here this afternoon. I would want to start with a little poll. Um, I, I hope that you are like me, that you enjoy reading books, and I wanted to share. Um, uh, so I have no, no rights and no interest in that book, just to be very clear. Um, um, the reason I'm bringing that book, I think it's an interesting reading these days. Um, uh, you can see it maybe from there. It's called Factfulness. Uh, please raise your hand if, uh, if you know that book, by the way. Just don't be shy, just like this, if you know or not. Um, if you have read it, I see uh, at least with the light one hand over there. It has been written by a Swedish writer uh, called Hans Rosling, who passed away some years ago, and that's his legacy uh, book, in fact. Uh, you also have read it, probably. And you are wondering, but, I mean, come on, this guy from EIF is completely nuts. I mean, we want to talk about alternative finance and why he's talking about something else, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> and the reason is that um, this book is about um, our perception of reality. What it says in a nutshell, it says that um, we, may, we have a bias when we think about uh, how the reality is good or, or bad, or, and we should rely more on statistics. In other words, we live in a world where um, we have the medias that have an interest to give us bad news, because that's what we want to hear. Good news are not very popular. And it's interesting maybe to see, to bring this uh, to our uh, field, because it's also one way to, to make sure to be a bit critical about what we know, how we know, what data we use, are the statistics we use accurate or outdated? And if they are outdated, they can bring us a wrong conclusion, by the way, afterwards. So I'm gonna start with a little uh, poll. I don't know if I can make it correctly, or someone can help me, but. There are plenty of questions, and I will not go further, otherwise it will be pleasure, or you'll be using something without any rights. But one of the questions in the beginning is linked to the um, level of poverty in the world. I, I don't know if you can see it on your phone, I don't know how it works. Uh, if can, someone can help me. Um, it doesn't appear anywhere. But the question, they would see, okay. So the question is, um, 
during the past 20 years, uh, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty, so which is our field, okay, um, has it doubled? Or A or B, did it remain uh, stable? Or uh, if it, uh, it has decreased, if it has halved? It's a simple question, A, B or C, doubled, stable or halved? So, yeah, uh, I think it's... Okay, so it's right. ongoing, ongoing, on, going on, okay. So just before we wait for the result, the, the idea, that's, that's why this book is interesting to read for fun during your time off or holidays or sleepless nights, whatever. Um, it, it asks this type of small questions which are um, showing that we may have, uh, uh, um, let's say, a strange representation of reality. So I don't know, are we, so in the past 20 years, I think it's stabilizing, we can say. Gentlemen, yes. what do you think? Oh, wait, 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 it's changing. <laughs> the almost oh. half that is, is, is going well. It's going and, better. and I'm asking the question vis-a-vis -vis like a reputable uh, flow of professionals of the field. So you should all be right. All know, obviously, by definition. Uh, okay, S so can we say that it's, uh, it's, it has ended, huh? So I cannot see really the result from here. Oh, is it? Um, still moving. 40, 40. 40%. 40%. <laughs> so the right answer is Neoclis. What do you think? Well, I think it's almost half. I will vote. I will vote to almost half. Even though I'm not quite sure, no, but I. I Let's say it's my hope. <laughs> Let's almost have it. Uh, I think it almost halved. Okay. Yeah. The same. The same. Okay. I know the results. And you know so. the results. <laughs> if not, I will. Uh, I will make a mistake. Surely. <laughs> so indeed, uh, and the answer is uh, halved. And what I wanted to to show here is that first of all, it's not that obvious, even with. I mean, professionals, and we arrive to a result that everybody should say, ah, obviously, it's halved. And you have, um, uh, when I say obviously, it means that this is a basic data, and you could talk about vaccination, you could talk about education, life expectancy. I would not do the same, but uh, it's very interesting to see the... It's, it means that we start with simple data to have a misrepresentation of reality, and that's something we should change. And then going back to our topic, obviously, um, I, I wanted to use that and, and as an introduction to try to see what we have today in the toolbox or in the experiences when it comes to financing, because we talk about financing micro and social organizations. That's the topic today. And seen from either, uh, think about better, more like a, a major powerhouse in terms of offering products or for uh, you, Ahmed and Neoclis, in terms of recipient of these products. And Andrea, you are brought to the panel just because you are at the frontier also of something emerging, which we structure the debate today, which is what is existing today and what is appearing at the frontier, which are, by the way, and I will take again a reference to that book, that we, there are lots of good news, in fact, in the world but we know more the bad news. We know more what doesn't go well because we are surrounded by this and our brain is completely every day attacked by the bad news. And we should think about all the small good news that are plenty, even much more, uh, much, uh, that, are, that are many. And the good news is that there is like initiative like yours and what, what we're gonna discuss about today. So now enough of talks to me, I'm not the, uh, uh, main person today, obviously. Uh, I would want to start maybe with you, uh, Hamed, if you don't mind, to explain um, in Poncha, I would want that to, what were your challenges or what are your challenges in terms of gathering the financing all, of all kinds to launch the venture?
Yes, yes, I know. No, no, it's all right. Do you hear me now? Yes. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks. I appreciate it. It's, it's a pleasure to be invited to the panel. Uh, well, I mean, maybe, maybe just a quick um, sort of introduction to what we do. Um, so um, at, the, at Puncture, um, sort of we, we have the same mission as, as Andrea uh, presented. Uh, we have a vision that no one should have difficulty in accessing finance. And uh, with that, uh, we also make that our mission um, to help financial, uh, to help companies, especially underserved and underprivileged entrepreneurs to access capital. And we started our journey as a, um, a digital online broker where entrepreneurs could come in and apply for loans and very quickly get loan offers from several lenders. But soon we also realized uh, there is a big gap in the market um, and, and thereby we, we launched our own loan product um, and, uh, and, and uh, backed by the European Investment Fund. Uh, they provided us with a, with a great guarantee to be able to uh, provide loans that are um, faster, that are cheaper and that are more flexible. Uh, to underprivileged uh, entrepreneurs in Sweden. Uh, in fact, um, in Sweden, there is a large population of underprivileged uh, entrepreneurs. A majority of them are immigrant entrepreneurs or women entrepreneurs. And of course, uh, immigrant women entrepreneurs who are the most underserved in the Swedish market. Um, so um, we, we build a solution to address that. Um, so maybe if you could just repeat the question, I can. <laughs> The question is, what was the most, uh, what, what were the challenges in, in raising uh, capital yes. and raising equity funds to start up? Yes, uh, so um, a, a journey of a sort of a greenfield MFI uh, is very interesting. So there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. So there's obviously a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to raising financing. I think um, one of the challenges that we faced uh, in our society in Sweden um, is the, is, the, is the sort of a familiarity or understanding of the fact that there is actually an underserved group, large underserved group in Sweden, uh, which needs support and needs help, which also contributes to nearly 40% of GDP of Sweden. And, and when it comes to financing, and one of the big challenges that we saw or or, or that we had to sort of deal with it a lot was around education educating financiers, educating investors, educating banks that these is, this is fact. This is nothing that we came up with. This is nothing that we hope that we will be. It is a fact. And, and, and that journey takes us, um, uh, that usually means that uh, you need to change their thinking. You need to change their way they see the market. And that takes a lot of time. And, and, and for a sort of greenfielder, for a startup in micro lending business, uh, time means money. Uh, you know, every day that you are spending time uh, trying to raise money, you're also burning your own uh, capital. And so I think that's one of the areas that, that we have been challenged a lot, um, educating financiers and investors to really believe in this and therefore so they get excited to actually invest so that they can both make money as well as do something good. Okay, I'm stopping you there because this is the uh, statement of your difficulties, I would say. And next, afterwards, we will see what can be done to, to, to what can be done to um, to take them away to to, to reduce, the, reduce the bottlenecks. Now I'm turning to you, Peter. If you can um, tell us, so with no transition, as we say in French. Uh, the point of view of the big powerhouse in terms of what you're offering and also you have been like like me i would say long in industry you you, you have the background of, of uh let's say what is the evolution what today you can bring and not going into the the future but on the today solutions mm -hmm. what 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 you can give largely to the market i would say in your team thank you <laughs> thank you for invitation uh I'm not sure if I'm in the round, round, right uh, forum, as actually I'm not representing more the alternative, but more the mainstream <laughs> financial sector. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll try to talk about uh, what we do, what could be seen as alternative. So firstly, uh, introducing uh, my institution and myself. So as, as mentioned, uh, I'm coming from Erste Group. 
uh, which is a large financial institution based in Vienna, covering approximately 10 CE markets. Uh, so we are a large bank with 350 billion euro balance sheet. <clears throat> and I'm within the bank uh, representing social banking, social finance. Uh, what might be interesting about Erste actually is that it was founded uh, 200 years ago as a bank for poor people, as the first bank on the territory of Austrian monarchy that opened literally the doors of banking for ordinary poor people to save money and take some small loans. Uh, the bank was, by the way, run by volunteers at that time. It was a social institution. So uh, now after 200 years, it's still part of the DNA and we are trying to give back uh, to the society and basically use uh, what we know the best, which is banking uh, for the impact of, for our society. So I don't know if we have, uh, yeah, we have there our, our couple of slides. I think here is the remote, so I'll just skip that a bit. So, so these are basically our markets. As I see it, uh, the formatting got disrupted, but probably you see that this is the part of the Europe uh, where we are, which is basically perceived as a part of European Union. It's already developing countries. We have seen in the past decades uh, the, the large international NGOs moving out from the region because it's all basically developed. It's part of the EU. But as you can see, we still uh, see there approximately 14 million people who are at risk of poverty or social exclusion. So <clears throat> the problem, as you mentioned, in Sweden is also existing, which is perceived as the, as the best country probably in Europe when talking about the, the welfare and the economic situation. But of course, still in our market, there is lots of to do. And so what, what we do in social banking, you see on the slide, <clears throat> this is basically our, our impact model. So when, when I started uh, with social banking 10 years ago, it was basically in the aftermath of the economic crisis. So we have seen high unemployment rates, especially in Balkan countries, uh, you know, it was reaching 40%. So we started with microfinance, especially financing uh, starting entrepreneurs, which usually, you know, was a market which was left aside by the banks, considered consider them very risky, you know. So you come to us when you reach the three years, you know, then we can look at your papers. So that was the approach. So we, we basically started uh, to finance them. Uh, from the day one with working capital startup loans, but always combined with financial education, business training, mentoring, consulting, uh, which we perceive as a very important also risk mitigation strategy, but of course, primarily helping those entrepreneurs to survive. The other uh, topic uh, was about social organizations, <clears throat> meaning NGOs, uh, social entrepreneurs, nonprofits. Uh, which were also and still unfortunately are perceived by the banks. You know, you are not corporate, you are not private individual, you are not a company, you are not <clears throat> a, a startup. So we, we basically don't know how to assess your, your balance sheet, your papers. So we can't provide a loan to you because actually how you want to repay if you are non-profit, right? So, uh, so in this, we have seen as a, as a big uh, issue uh, with scaling of these organizations. So, of course, they are very much small and need money to be able to scale. So we started with lending to social organizations. It's mainly about providing them bridge capital, but also investment loans, working capital loans, again, uh, with education, uh, with the goal that they scale, that they provide more social impact uh, and more social good for society. And the last but not least part, which is for us the most difficult to be done, it's about actually helping uh, people who are excluded in financial difficulties, you know, Roma, migrants, refugees, <clears throat> uh, in, in uh, dealing with their finance, with some special accounts, with housing solutions, with debt advisory. So that's, that's basically the, the toolbox which you are asking for, uh, which, we are, which we are using uh, in, our, in our work. And maybe I'll stop here not to go into too many details. That's just per perfect. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Um, uh, uh, just as a comment, I think we've we've got um, from EIF. Basically, we have got the same approach of like a big uh, product. We want to massively push. So that's uh, that's what uh, I can recognize. And I didn't say that uh, it's an honor also that Peter, you are part of the uh, InvestEU uh, steering committee, isn't it? Investment committee. Uh, investment committee sorry. So so Peter is also like. Um, uh, spare heading, like I would say, the development of, of, of the large mandate. I'm doing a little bit of uh, advertisement on the side uh, on Investium. Um, 
So thanks a lot. Here we have seen with you basically what the, the big powerhouse can put uh, with strength, I would say, to the market in, in several geographies. Then again, that's the beauty of this panel. We Now we come back to Greece suddenly from Vienna and Neoclis. Um, so if you can also share still the same topic about um, raising the first financing, how you, you, you so you, you, you found it and you, you run uh, MicroSmart. And obviously, cash is king. And um, please tell us where you stand, how you have been doing to, to, to get these first financing uh, sources. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, everybody. Kalispera, uh, to our city, to our country. Thank you for being here. Well, we're exactly on that stage, funding. Uh, I'm Neoclis, I'm more, almost all, no, no, I know you. Uh, for the last six years, we were working, trying to set up a microfinance institution, and with a lot of effort, with a lot of support, we managed to set up one in January. Uh, fundraising, initial equity, came from friends, full and family. That's the original uh, pronunciation, and that's what exactly what we do. So we managed to find some funding from people that are close to us, and we are exactly on that stage of getting more funding to start operations. So I don't know if my presentation is live. Uh, I wanted to start basically discussing some things that we have discussed on the previous uh, Alternative Finance Forum about the situation, what's happening in Greece. So uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, my slide is, can we have it? Thanks. Okay. So that was a slide that I started my two, two two years ago, and I want to link to your starting point, Samuel. Uh, these are the data that we have in 2020 about what was the situation with the Greek SMEs and the Greek economy, and which are able to get funding or excluded. So we found out after two years that uh, some data here are awful and others are even better. For example, uh, we don't have only 20,000 SMEs that are bankable, we have 30,000, which is okay, an increase. And the hope of the government and our policy offices by the end of the next couple of years, this number go to 100,000 SMEs. Now, the bad news is that we don't have 800,000 SMEs, we have 1.1 million. And the data came from uh, an obligation that all SMEs have to the tax office to upload all their invoices on the day they issue them from in the last two years. In e invoicing is live. So we have more accuracy of who exists out there. So we have bigger problem to solve because we have quite very different number of SMEs that we must raise. And also more data show uh, from this very, very important market analysis that I'm using to all my policies offices and all the investors that want to invest in us. What is the situation in our country and what is the gap, the financial gap we have? Our biggest problem is that we have biggest problem. Anyway, uh, the projections of the Greek economy are even better than expected. We are growing fast in, in, in what was happening in the previous year. So we need more money for the economy to grow. We need around 500 million euros annually for microfinance. And we must find them in order to have this growth coming. So what we have, we have done? Uh, we work for the, our government to set up a legal framework. It's one of the, I think this, this is the youngest legal framework in, in Europe on microfinance. We, are, we set up in January. We managed to have our license in March by the Bank of Greece with, with the process which was very intense but productive. And we want to do our first FinTech microfinance institution with a lot of human touch, not to be only FinTech. Because from my experience as an entrepreneur setting up the company, uh, I tried to open a bank account for depositing my, my initial equity. Uh, with one bank that is mostly digital from January until now, we have not finished. Another bank th threw me out, just like that. We said just no, with no reason. Uh, another told me you need three or four months. And with a bank that I have very good friends, somehow I managed to set up the fund, <laughs> they set up the company. Uh, as I said, we are part of friends here, uh, setting up a company. One is in cross-border friends. I'm a shareholder and founder, ABC Foundation, which is the key founder of Fondi Besa, one of the biggest MFIs that we have in the Balkan area. And BDF Foundation, who used to be one of the founder and running of microphones. So a Bulgarian, an Albanian, and a Greek guy setting up something. 
in Greece and what we offer, what the legislation allows us, and which is more than enough, loans, leasing, guarantees, and most, likely, most important, business development services. We want to offer to our clients services that they can grow, not just give money and take them back. No fees, no extras, digital process, and we must want to cover whole country. Digitally, basically, we have our website launch, exists, so people, in theory, can just start communicating with us. We're not 100% ready, because we are exactly on this position of fundraise. Uh, we want to be secure in order to start operations. And we hope we will be ready in the next couple of months. Maybe after summer, we will be able to start operating and give to cover all the demand that we have in the Greek country. So what's the story so far? And thank you once again. Perfect. I think I'm going to stop you for now so that we I can have a good bit of time. Um, I'm, I've got already a question for you, but I'm keeping it in the back of my mind. So I'm turning to you now, Andrea, who are, you are the, the lucky winner, two panels in the row, like in the afternoon, so you're already. <laughs> um, but I'm going to ask you a specific same question, which is with Micro Europe, uh, um, can you explain again how uh, you are getting the, the, the sources of funds? So how you finance and uh, how, how the, what are the difficulties to get the, the, the funds to, to, to create Micro Europe and where, what else do you need to, to, to do your uh, journey? Okay, okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, underline the two misleading fact, uh, the, 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 f the first. Maybe. Okay, the, the first fact, uh, the first misleading fact is that uh, I'm not Bogdan Merfea, uh, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, Bogdan is uh, probably a bit uh, older than me and is uh, a better um, tennis player, innovator, and the founder of a fantastic microfinance institution in in in, uh, in Romania, and so I, I'm I'm a substitute, but not with the big uh, so 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 important uh, dignity of uh, of uh, of Bogdan. The second fact, misleading, misleading fact that is joined to your question is that uh, starting when when we we have started to analyze market to prepare micro Europe. We obviously we, we we read we have read a lot of number figures analysis data in order to understand if the market could be exist. Uh, there are a lot of unbankable people, and it's so evident probably in that book too. Uh, but uh, are, are not uh, our clients because we invest in institutions that help unbankable people or unserved people. The reality is that there are a lot of financial institutions that uh, they are eager to include people. And so, in our mind, there are a lot of uh, bad guys that would like to exclude people. And so we speak about exclusion, financial exclusion. And so, very bad guys, probably bankers, that would like to to, obviously, I, I'm joking, that they, 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 are, they are thinking the best way to exclude people. It, 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 it's not a fact. The fact today is that there is a lot of people that are eager to include other people. There are a lot of institutions that are eager to include uh, new clients. Because uh, two reasons. The first one, the, 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 the first one is uh, uh, because of their willingness, and so b good news. The second one because of fact, because there are more and more excluded people because of a lot of reason. A lot of th these reasons are not joined to willingness of the banks, but for system from a, a lot of reason really. But the fact is that exist excluded people and there are a lot of financial intermediaries that would like to, 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 to assist these people. And uh, arriving to your question, the fundraising for Micro Europe is difficult as uh, all funds that uh, are starting because we need to convince that our activity is directed to, to a, social, a real social impact. But uh, we have found a lot of investors that are eager again to help someone ready to uh, assist unbankable people or vulnerable people. And so 
the, the, the factor today is that uh, um, people that have money, that are rich people, maybe, but it's not the, the, courage, uh, the courage adjective, they, there are a lot of people that have money that are eager to invest in something with value and not only with interest rate. And this is the good news and is founded by facts and probably is the reason because today we, have, we are here in this alternative uh, forum with a banker that uh, was born uh, 200 uh, years before alternative finance. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's a fact. It's a fact that Ars Bank make some alternative things a lot here before us. And so go ahead because uh, investors exist. But, uh, I didn't know, uh, but. Uh... <laughs> 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 you will tell, you, tell us your birthday so that we can see. Uh, I, I, I cannot resist. I mean, you know that I've taken that book as a piece of uh, pleasure today. One of the lessons you, I can even give you the page, but I won't do it. It's they tell about op being optimistic, pessimistic, the, uh, this, uh, the writer. But he says he's encouraging us to see the current status and the trend. And to say, to combine that some things are bad, but they are getting better at the same time. It's a combination. That's exactly what you are describing. And to, that we need to, to, to have the mental attitude to exercise ourselves to, to see the bad and the better in the, at the same time. So I couldn't resist because this is what you explained. And now the transition to the second part that will lead us after to the last part of the panel is you told in, uh, in a couple of words, each of you, thank you for that, where you stand with like, uh, let's say, a, a new venture start, a, a fintech, like a powerhouse, well established, uh, celebrating 200 years, uh, a, a new MFI and a, f a new fund, let's put it like this. Now the question is, you are facing issues, you have troubles that you have overcome or need to overcome. I'm talking about the legal framework or even like the uh, fundraising. So my, I will ask you to each of you, what are your issues and what do you, would you need to overcome them? So if we think about now the, the future, and in particular for you, Peter, with all your experience, what afterwards, maybe we can start with you. After 200 years of existence, <laughs> a great uh, powerhouse operating in many geographies, what could be next that will come to us? So, so you want that I talk about, I the, secrets. about, about the, the problems, then I would need one hour, or about, <laughs> <laughs> about the future the solutions. solutions. <laughs> you have obviously a couple of minutes, so more solutions than problems. Solutions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the future for you? Well, I think uh, what we are moving is kind of from the traditional uh, instruments which have been used somehow in, in the past years. We are moving and testing more innovative uh, social finance instruments. Uh, we have launched uh, five, six years ago, the first social impact bond. Now we are running the second social impact bond together with the Ministry of Social Finance. So for those of you who are not familiar with this kind of technocratic terminology, uh, it's not a real bond, but it's more like a, like a future contract for certain outcome delivery. And if the outcome delivery is there, then the investors are being, being paid. Uh, so it's basically like a pre-financing for some social innovations. So I think that's, that's something which is uh, which is running already in a couple of European countries. It's getting more and more spin. So I think that's, that's a very good and useful tool for testing new approaches. Uh, what we started with, which is also not very kind of uh, uh, natural to a bank, is that we started with investing. Uh, we started with quasi-equity, so like a mezzanine financing, which we provide for uh, social entrepreneurs and also for NGOs in our region. <clears throat> so that's where we try to kind of move outside of our comfort zone. And, and we also look at what could be the big, big thing, uh, you know, and how can we kind of support the development of social economy in our region? Uh, because what we see is that in contradiction uh, to the regular businesses, you know, social economy is very fragmented, very regional, very local, you know. I mean, we are happy to just support our community here in this city, you know. And that's, that's sometimes also a mindset problem because if you talk with a, with the entrepreneurs who are there for profits or maybe for something else as well, but who are 
having this kind of drive, they would like to kind of conquer the world. And sometimes we see with the social entrepreneurs or also with the NGO that they are just happy to have their small thing here. And, and uh, so that's something I think what is, what is of course hindering the development of, of social ecosystem or social economy in the terminology of European uh, Commission. What we also don't see is like a cross-border investment. So even though there are successful social enterprises uh, working in Germany or in France, we don't see them, you know, coming to our markets. We don't see them doing kind of the, the investments because the whole uh, convergence in Eastern Europe if you look from 90s, actually came with the investments from uh, wealthy, actually West European or American companies who brought the capital and the know-how. And that's not happening, you know, in the last 30 years in the social sector. We haven't seen, you know, the big social enterprises or the big uh, NGOs, I don't know, from France coming to start running, you know, I don't know, uh, care centers in, in, in Eastern Europe. So, and I think that's, that's something which is, which is, which is missing. Uh, because, of course, you need to have certain uh, scale, you need to have certain dimensions to be able to get economy of scale, to be able to grow and to bring more impact in an efficient manner. So I think that's, that's something uh, which I think is an opportunity for <clears throat> the new technology, which I, as an uh, 200, old, <laughs> 200 years old gentleman, did not understand this DOA or how it was called before our lunch. So, so basically, I think this digital technology should enable this kind of networking, collaboration, uh, bringing those small organizations together to really become a large corporate kind of uh, type of an animal, because then you can, of course, have impact which is much larger than just a small organization in one small city. Thanks, a lot. it's a brilliant uh, speech, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, and in fact, then I would want to follow up with you. I mean, basically, uh, uh, in the footstep of what was just said by Peter, like on, um, we see in, in Sweden uh, uh, um, a handful of, of new initiatives that are uh, cross countries uh, rooted, and uh, not only in Sweden, but also in Sweden we see that. Can you explain, seen from Poncha, uh, what could be the way basically to, to operate not only in Sweden, but also in other uh, geographies, should you get the financing that you you, you need. Is it a possibility that you could, you could do what Peter would like to have, like, that you would massively develop uh, out of Stockholm uh, and cover like, uh, several countries? Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and what would be the, 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 the requirement? Basically? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, uh, we, we consider ourselves you know, a fintech company, uh, firstly, and, 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 and very ambitious. I mean, we we are of course in there uh, for profit, but also doing good. We believe that both can be accomplished together. They don't exclude each other. Um, and and uh, we, we actually, you know, we were, I think we were smart very early on, started investing in building our own platform, our own tech to be scalable. In fact, when you look at our forecast numbers, it includes six countries in five years. And we're talking about uh, several billions of euros portfolio. Uh, because it is very achievable when you actually put, use the technology in the right way, you're building credit processes that are streamlined, you bring also experience into that from, you know, experience part risk, which is, it's not the first time having done, you know, credit policy, you know, uh, risk assessment procedures. Um, but of course, there's differences between the markets. And, and one of the things that, that is a barrier for I think um, financial institution as a whole is of course regulation, which is quite different between different countries. That becomes a, quite a big obstacle un unless you actually have a very deep pocket uh, that you can afford that or partner with an institution who can take you under their umbrella and using their wings to fly over you know, other countries. Um, when it comes to financing, uh, and, and that's, that gets very interesting, I think um, I think there's differences. Um, I think, uh, so, so in my experience, at least in a few countries now, I've been around in the social, you know, social impact as well as, you know, financial community. Uh, I, see, I see clear differences between, you know, where, where the interest, the, the sort of a, the, the common interest lies, in, right? So in the Nordics, there is, it's, 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 it's fantastic how much capital is available if you're doing anything with sustainability, green, you know, environment. And whereas when you move to the UK, you see completely the opposite. So social impact becomes a big, you know, uh, interest and green and, you know, uh, is, is less. 
Um, and, and, and we were actually in, in the UK in some large investment forum, and, and it was a topic. Every country you go to, there's different flavors. So across all the ESG targets, everything is interesting, but where do you put your money is a selected few, and, and, and it's different in the Nordics. That's why we actually started this, you know, for on the funding side, started talking to British investors, because they understand better social impact, and they have more interest in social impact. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are barriers there, right? So there are not many actors who can do cross-country investments. You know, they would rather you to be in the UK than doing that remotely in Sweden. But then you have to promise them in two years you're going to be in the UK. Um, and then, then, then the sum of money you, you, know, you would ask them all will become double because then there's regulation that to take into account. So I, I, think, um, I, I, think, I think one thing it, 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 I, I notice a lot is Almost every microfinance institution I've ever met have had, starting with grants, starting with donations, starting with very, very extremely soft money. And, and, and in all, I think, I think in all lending businesses, we, all, we, have, we have done this several times, we know this, you have to try to find out your proof points in your default rates, in your market, in, in the ROIs and in margins and you know, recovery rates. And that is why soft money is very interesting. And also, in contrast, that is why risk capital is not the first mover into an early stage you know, market finance institution. And, 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 and because of that, I, th I think uh, we need to find those pots of money. And, and one of the actors who have a lot of resources, I believe, is the European Investment Bank and European Investment Fund. Uh, which we have been blessed by, you know, you provided us with a great guarantee. Um, I, I, I do, however, uh, you know, I, I, I could have wished for probably, you know, uh, maybe we should have asked for more hand-holding from European Investment Fund in the beginning, uh, because um, obviously there's a big difference between us and a firm with, you know, half a billion a portfolio that gets a guarantee because they can get a guarantee and then they, they already have their own funding structure in place. Whereas we get a guarantee, then we have to go find senior financing, junior financing, equity financier. Um, so, the, and, and there's so many, you know, multi-parties, you know, stakeholders in here we have to get together. So we could have probably, you know, uh, I wish that probably we should have asked earlier. Yeah, so <laughs> we discussed it yesterday uh, and it's true that um, there is a need, I mean, or we can help by being, we, we call it being catalytic. I don't know if it's true or not, but by, uh, by talking to various investors. Thanks a lot, Ahmed. Yeah. And then, um, just staying maybe on the regulation side, just uh, if you can say a word uh, on Greece is a unique case, uh, as, as we speak, in terms of uh, recently, if we can say, set a new legal framework that is enabling you to start. Exactly. If you can just say a word, well, how, what was your experience and what it allowed, in fact? Well, we had the luck uh, to have 2020 in the summer of 2020 legislation for microfinance station. Uh, even though we, we needed five years, six different, different ministers, ten vice ministers, I don't know how many governments we had at that period of time, but nevertheless, we have a legislation that uh, it's structured around the code of good conduct for microfinance, microfinance provision. That gives us benefit to show to our possible investors, to regulators, that the best practices for the sector are here in the law and we must follow it. So that's the good part of the story. The bad part of the story is how to persuade the supervisors that we're not a bank. We're an institution like a fund, like something else, which does not need so much things to be monitored in the future. But okay, we can work on that. It's not, uh, we, can, we will find the solution in the process. So, the Greece has the youngest legislation in microfinance in Europe, and it, I invite you all to take a look at it. it. It makes a lot of sense if, in other countries, I don't know, others have laws, others have other ideas, but it's a solution that you may follow. And don't forget, we have a code of good contact. That's something we have gained as in the European Union. It's a solution also to secure things that things will not go wrong. For me, uh, not lending is uh, a problem, and over is something that we all focus upon. Uh, the new thing that must focus is uh, buy, buy now, pay later uh, story, but which nobody monitors, nobody knows exactly 
which is the overdebtedness of an individual. That's the thing that must focus on in terms of monitoring and on what is going on in the market. All the other elements are here. And I hope in the next forum, in a, after a couple of years, I will give you more data of how things work. Good news. And good things news. happening. Excellent. And um, I don't know how much time is left. <coughs> uh, okay. Excellent. So maybe like a quick word uh, to, to you, Andrea. Just a quick word, please, on... Um, what, what, what are your obstacles today? What, 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 you, 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 what you need to lift as obstacles to, to develop the fund? I mean, what, what do you need? Uh, investments or something else? No, we, we need uh, as uh, as whole uh, enterprise to, to uh, find the good clients. And so our clients are uh, investees. And, uh, or not clients, but uh, as I explained, uh, explained uh, before. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I believe uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, good investors and so clients for us. Uh, and uh, we need uh, to remove the principal obstacle that is uh, the anti europeanist uh, uh, approach. And so we need to show people that the European people should help uh, European people. Uh, the European people need to help European people a part of a European institution. And so the, the obstacle today in my mind is, uh, is uh, cultural. And so we need to show us uh, that uh, the, Europe, the Europe is a community before than an institution. And so we are, uh, we are struggling in this part uh, to move uh, people that have money to put a disposal to people that have idea, that have uh, aim to help uh, in order to, to link uh, this different part of, uh, of Europe that are not only Western, Eastern, uh, Central, North, uh, Southern, and, but uh, there are different parts of uh, Europe that uh, need to start to help uh, themselves, uh, not waiting only by European institutions that are crucial, important and so on, but uh, is not to know today. Because uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first point today is uh, to survive, because you know perfectly, you, you, uh, probably you, you have heard about uh, climate change and so if you, if you would like to, to survive, uh, uh, we need to, to think about uh, some special, and some special is rooted in our willingness to help uh, uh, each other. Excellent. So before I do the final thank you to all of you, um, I, I think it deserves just to say as a conclusion, it was visible today uh, by the high quality of, of the discussions that we are on the right track. I mean, okay, the facts are there. We have done a lot. There's, uh, the initiatives, ideas, power, uh, intelligence everywhere so to, to lead our field towards the right direction. So thank you to all of you to have joined and uh, have a nice afternoon. Thank you for listening.